Well, the church in America is dying. How's that for an attention grabber? I know as you sit at home today or, or sit in your pajamas, maybe you don't want to hear that. You've likely heard it. I've heard it. Uh, is the church really dying? And I'll put quotes around dying. Uh, I strongly believe that the church will never die. Uh, not, not just because it says so in, in the Bible. When we get to the end of the Bible, the only thing that continues is God's church. But I, I say that because I'm familiar with church history and the church has endured a lot in the last 2,000 years. Uh, in my lifetime, think about it this way, in my lifetime, I'm not that old, but the, the church in, the Christian church in Asia and Europe, uh, at one time, not too long ago, was declared dead, but has today uh, experienced uh, revival and resurgence. Just a couple generations ago, the church Christianity in, in Africa was almost non-existence. But today, the church is growing exponentially. In North America, however, the church has become not obsolete, close, but maybe a better word is dormant. But I believe there are signs of hope. The church in, in, in a few years may not look like the church that you have become familiar with. Well, what will it look like? Well, before you get too far ahead of me, I, I don't believe that the answer is creating rock concerts in our, in our worship venues. I, I don't believe that it involves smoke and, and mirrors, nor do I believe that it involves fire and brimstone service sermons uh, where you need to follow Jesus or you're going to hell type of theology. That's just bad strategy. Uh, and that's just my own opinion. You may have a different opinion. I, I could be wrong, but I think we need to begin somewhere. And so as we begin 2024 with some things that we know will happen and prepare for the things that will happen that we're not really expecting to happen, we need to begin somewhere. So let's, let's begin with the idea of being a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is a follower, but more than a follower, uh, more like a student. You, 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 to be a disciple is you study somebody's, not only their words, but their, their actions. You're watching and taking notes. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you do when? Uh, how did you handle this? Or, oh, I see how you handled this situation. So in our world today, I think it's a good question. Let's start with the basics. What makes a disciple a disciple? Well, there's, there's five areas or five keys to discipleship that we're going to start looking at today uh, and over the next few weeks. But it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's the topic for today. Uh, but not, not just a, a relationship, but a personal relationship. Secondly, it, it involves growth through study, through joining a class, through small groups, through your own devotionals. Um, but, as we'll talk about next week, not, not just growing in faith, but accountable growth. Third is service, serving others through acts of love and compassion. And when we get to that point, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to explore your spiritual gifts. And then fourth, there's, there's stewardship. As, as God's 
creation. We are God's creation. We are God's children. We are stewards of the gifts of time and talents and resources and relationships. And finally, the, the fifth key to discipleship is sharing the gospel or making new disciples. We share our own personal faith story for the sole purpose of bringing others into a, into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You notice the, the cycle here? This, this is the cycle of discipleship. And it all begins with a relationship. But, but not just any relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. One of my favorite pastors, uh, theologians, and writers is a man named Mike Slaughter. And he defines this personal relationship with Jesus like this. He writes, having a personal relationship with Jesus means a disciple sees and knows him as a living friend, not just a historical figure. This relationship is personal, not institutional, and it is motivated by how the disciple can give glory to God in all aspects of their life. I love that, that definition, and that's a great place to start thinking about your own personal relationship with Jesus. Recently, I, I came across an interesting article written by a man named Mark Price of the Akron, uh, Ohio Beacon Journal. And the title of it is Tomorrow is Yesterday, 100-Year-Old Predictions About 2023. And Mr. Price found an article about a group of creative minds. Back in 1923, they were asked to uh, use their imagination and think about life in 2023. So what if somebody came to you and asked you, what, what do you think life will be like? Uh, for people in the year 2123. Well, as he looked back and he listed these predictions of what life will be like 100 years from now, uh, as you can imagine, some of them were pretty wild, but also some of them were weirdly accurate. That's the only way I can put it. A New York scientist by the name of Charles Steinmetz predicted that by the year 2023, electric power would usher in a utopian society, freeing humans from the drudgery of hard labor, he wrote, when people will work not more than four hours a day. Yeah, right. He wrote, thanks to breakthroughs in science, every city will be a spotless town with no garbage in the street and no smoke in the sky. Nice guess, nice utopia, but not reality. A New York businesswoman by the name of Alice McDougall believed that by 2023, most of the world's business would be conducted by women. Here's what she wrote. I don't pretend to predict what men will do if women are doing all the business. Someone has to do the housekeeping, she said. And if women are otherwise engaged, the men will have to do it. Probably by that time, she wrote, inventors will have relieved human drudgery to such an extent that will, it will be pretty easy for men. Movie director D.W. Griffith predicted that movies will expand to the point that by the year 2023, this new device that we're calling television will be obsolete. Yeah, nice try. I like this, the editor of the Buffalo New York Courier noted the year 2023 will see all men wearing flowing curly locks and all women with shaven heads. And then he added on, we should worry. In English physicist, engineer, and inventor Archibald Lowe, however, was eerily accurate in his prediction. He wrote that a typical businessman would use a communication device that would simplify his work. He wrote, in a hundred years time, he will be able to chat in comfort over a telephone that can be used in his car, in his house, or train. 
probably it will be possible for him to see the person to whom he is talking. You know, that's pretty doggone wild. So as I read this article, it occurred to me that, that predicting the world 100 years from now may be easier than predicting what will happen tomorrow or even next week. You know, January weather in Northwest Indiana is, is always iffy. You know, we do have a policy for what we need to do if on occasion we need to cancel worship because of weather. But there's nothing in our policy about what do we do when there's water coming through the ceiling and, and the sanctuary gets wet. Well, if life teaches us anything, it teaches us that we need to take life one day at a time. But it also, we know, we, we know this, we don't always confess it, but, but human beings have a, a unique ability to adapt. Um, we like the known, we prefer the planned, and we crave the routine because it's known. But yet, we, we have the ability to adapt. Uh, Wednesday morning, this past Wednesday morning, when all this was happening in the sanctuary and, and people were running about, putting away the, the, the Christmas and Advent decorations while at the same time trying to clean up the water, uh, Pastor Mark and Dr. Christopher and I were having a conversation and, and the question was, well, what do we do about this Sunday? That was my question. Pastor Mark, who is, is usually the voice of calm reason, looked at us and said, well, we've been through this before. And he was absolutely right. We had been through this before four years ago, almost to the month when a pandemic began. In the midst of change, especially when there is sudden change, relationships matter. We find that the people around us matter. The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Rome. Uh, they were living in a time not like our own in North America today. It was, it was highly polit a highly political, politically charged environment. There was a lot of tension. Life was, was difficult. Uh, but there was a new message that was being spread about this, this man named Jesus of, of Nazareth. And it was not only uh, an exciting message, but at the same time, it was creating division. Any of that sound familiar? Paul begs those who are, are following Jesus in, in Rome to be living sacrifices. I wanna share with you from the book of Romans, Maybe you can open your Bible to Romans 12. And I would encourage you to read all of Romans 12. It's a great chapter. But I'm going to share just a, a couple of verses. Uh, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That, that, is, that is Paul's urgent message for the future. Whatever you face, whatever you run into, seek the mind of God. And the relationships matter, not only our relationships with one another, but our relationships with, with God. For Jesus' first disciples in John 14, and if you want to turn your Bible over to John 14, they were going through an equally confusing and difficult time with, with Jesus. What was happening around them was not part of their plan. Things were, were still coming together. But their life was about to be turned upside down. Their future together suddenly became very confusing and unpredictable. 
But their relationship with Jesus uh, by this point was very personal. They'd been together for three years. And so they had a unique connection, a personal friendship and relationship with Jesus. They trusted Jesus and Jesus trusted them. And so in, in the midst of all this unpredictability, all this confusion, I love what Jesus says in John 14. They're timeless words. So in John 14, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? He's already providing for their future. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, in other words, if you have a relationship, a personal relationship with me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. That's, that's a great gift. The, the relationship matters. The relationship with Jesus matters. The relationship with one another matters. And so take a moment to think about your own relationship with this Jesus. Are you simply acquainted with him? Or do you really know him? Do you know him as a passing acquaintance? Or do you have a personal relationship with him? Would, would you recognize him in the busyness of life? One day, Jesus asked his disciples a very important question, a life-shaping and life-changing question. He, he asked them a great question, who do you say I am? And you know, we ask us this question, it, it, it's, it's the most important question we'll ever respond to. Who do you say Jesus is? Here's, what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the question that begs is, is Jesus your way? Is Jesus your truth? Is, is Jesus your life? You know, and again, People ask questions. There have been times when people say, well, I don't like that because it's just too exclusive. And for a long time, when I would hear that, I, I would see my job as, as a pastor, as a Christian, as, as a disciple of Jesus. Well, I need to jump up and defend Jesus in this. And, but instead of breaking out in debate, what I've, what I've learned is we're not called to debate that. But I would invite you to look into it for yourself. If, if you question that statement, maybe it's time to explore who Jesus is in the life of a disciple. There's, there's a great book that I read a long time ago by Phil Jackson, the uh, Hall of Fame basketball coach. He po coached the, the Bulls. Uh, many of you are familiar with him. But Phil Jackson grew up with a pastor who was a, a Pentecostal preacher. And so Phil struggled with his own spirituality, his sense of belief, his sense of being a Christian. But he wrote an autobiography that he entitled Sacred Hoops about his relationship, not only with his father, but with the church. And I just want to share part of it with you. Phil Jackson writes, when I was little, and it's insightful here, my mother tried to force me to submit to her will, cramming my head with Bible passages, making me eat with my right hand instead of my left. He's left-handed. 
While my father looked on benignly and loved me unconditionally, no matter what I did, it struck me that I had inherited my mother's mind and my father's heart, and those two sides of my character were still in conflict. The part of me that was like my mother, always searching for logical answers, always trying to exert control, usually won out over the part that, like my father, was moved by compassion, trusting the song in my heart. One summer, my parents and my brother and I got into a heated theological debate after dinner. A common occurrence, he writes, whenever you get two or more Jacksons in a room. Early in the evening, my father checked out and went to bed. The next day, when I asked him why he had left the conversation, he replied, arguing is not where faith is. That just feeds the ego. It's all in the doing. And then Jackson writes this, to him, there were certain mysteries that you could only understand with the heart. And intellectualizing about them was a waste of time. He accepted God on faith and lived his life accordingly. That's, that's really a great definition of a disciple. To trust God and live our lives accordingly as, as his disciples. And so as we wrap this up, when, when you think about your own relationship with Jesus today, remember that it's not about being religious. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. Remember, it's not about an argument. It's about a relationship. It's, it's not about bringing more religion and more conflict into the world. That's not really what the world needs more of. But what the world needs and what we need, what I need, what you need, what we all need, is more of Jesus and less of me, less of us. And so think about that, that personal relationship. If you know who Jesus is and, and you want to make it personal, then I would invite you to, to do what, what we just did. Get, get into the Bible. Get into the four Gospels. Start with the Gospel of John. Learn who Jesus is and start that relationship and just start a conversation with him. And take some quiet time. And find out what you learn about this Jesus and come closer to him. He hasn't walked away from you. He's as close as a breath. He's right there waiting for you to turn to him. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you today. And, and I pray for each person who is, is watching this from home or on their device or wherever they're, they're watching this, that, that they would take time to think about their relationship with you. And despite their hesitancy, despite any qualms or arguments, that we would just take time to get to know Jesus as our friend, as our redeemer, as our comforter, as the one who provided grace in the midst of, of conflict, the one who conquered death for our sake and who is living and whose return we wait. And so for all those who are questioning or need to go deeper in that relationship, I lift them up to you and just pray for each one of us on this day that is, is difficult and in the unpredictability and uncertainty of life. We know that you are with us. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join together with us in, in the hymn.